How you doing? <laughs> Bitches leave. <laughs> The 80s American action movie is an immediately familiar brand. It features an unstoppable masculine hero, minimal story depth, and tons of violence. The stars were roided up, the MPAA was dialed back, and the female characters were damsels in prices. But the era of the kick-ass and chewed bubblegum protagonists couldn't last forever. And a new trope rose to prominence at the tail end of the decade. A hero who was largely a normal guy in his day-to-day -day life, but had it in him to kick ass. The audience relation to these archetypes is pretty obvious. The Schwarzenegger is seminal power fantasy. A hulk of a man who stops a bad guy with big guns. The protagonist trusts his gut above all else, shoots first, asks questions later, and totally gets laid. He's also usually active or former police or military, going up against flatly villainous gangs or Soviets. He speaks to an image of masculinity that boasts mythic proportions, reminding us that even though the world has changed, there won't ever be nothing better than guys being dudes. Meanwhile, the John McClane resembles a fantasy of the average white man rising to absurd occasions. This trope was coined as the impossible white man by Rod of the Black Guy Who Tips podcast, and it arrived with a shift toward a leaner, more white-collar ideal of masculinity. One that emphasized skill and precision over salt of the earth, uber menschness. Saying this is not to deride the campy charm of 80s action and all its homoeroticism, nor even the impossible white man offspring on the whole. There are many criticisms to be made of their genre conventions, but identifying the trope isn't the end of analysis. John Wick and The Running Man can both be cool. I'm just laying out the tapestry so that I can present my case for the 80s style's final masterpiece. A swan song to reflect on the genre and push it to the limit at the same time. The perfect production of a changing landscape that exists between epics. I'm talking about Demolition Man. How can you justify destroying a seven million dollar mini mall to rescue a girl whose ransom is only twenty five thousand dollars? Fuck you, lady! Demolition Man, released in 1993, was likely penned at the tail end of the 80s, but being shot and released in the rapid transition to the modern blockbuster, it perfectly embodies the post-Reagan era energy of George H.W. Bush and Bill Clinton's administrations. The setup fits in perfectly with the previous era. A renegade cop, played by Sylvester Stallone, is released from cryostasis after 30 years to catch a dangerous criminal from his timeline. But despite the plot summary being simply conservative at face value, the film is stuffed with a layer of irony that's customary of the 90s. The result is a cultural artifact so lovably asinine. Its vision of the future looks like something Philip K. Dick would have written, though it's only 2030. A common, overly optimistic guess at the 21st century for the time. It has a utopic array of technology, like self-driving cars and anti-graffiti machines. However, its peaceful veneer is oppressive to the individual, a concern that would surely reflect conservative sermons about the degradation of human society. People are fine for swearing, speech is robotic, lacking in figurative language, and awkwardly descriptive. People never touch to the extent that virtual sex is the norm. What are you doing? Breaking the law. And San Angeles, a megacity combining LA, San Diego, and Santa Barbara, is basically owned and operated by a liberal billionaire. He's praised for bringing stability to the city, but in reality he's played by an Englishman. That's who you remind me of. An evil Mr. Rogers. Dr. Raymond Cocteau was able to earn the image of great benefactor by rebuilding in the wake of some all-out chaos that Fox News would pitch as the future of crime rate in LA if the Democrats continue to increase the police budget by 3 million rather than 5 billion every year. This whole premise, silly as it comes off, dangled the concerns of the political landscape for its time. The United States was coming off of Reaganomics, deregulation, shrinking the social democratic safety net, enriching the private sector, and establishing a far more global corporatist network. The birth of neoliberalism. The narratives of network news focusing on urban crime waves, which was both propaganda for the presumed necessity of police, as well as policy that would target the poor and specifically black people, was taking a stronger hold on viewers than ever. This is in part due to an ever-expanding and more efficient corporate media and growing fears 
in the white middle class of urban expansion. The idea that people are inherently bad, cities are dangerous, and therefore cops are more necessary than ever to keep you safe. Meanwhile, the fallacy of trickle-down theory was becoming more apparent, and youth culture was characterized by disillusionment with the past generation's notions of success. It was time for the promises of suburbia to deliver, and everybody could see they gained nothing but rampant consumerism. John Spartan is introduced in a peak Stallone soldier cop raid. Phoenix, played by Wesley Snipes, who is both in his prime and fully committed to the silly, goofy mood, is a diabolical supervillain who brings a building with 30 hostages to blow for the fuck of it. Spartan skips due process to rush in, is charged as sharing responsibility for the death of the hostages, and both he and Phoenix are put into a cryostasis prison system. After Phoenix is released in 2032 with inexplicable sleeper cell knowledge of the city's grid system, it's clear that modern cops are unequipped to handle a hardcore criminal. So Detective Huxley, played by Sandra Bullock, also at peak career hotness, a young officer who romanticizes the era of gritty police work, proposes they catch this hooligan with the toughest nails cop from his time. John Spartan. Spartan is thought out under the condition that he helps catch Phoenix and quickly begins showing these betas how it's done. However, his ruffian mannerisms are too much for the high society and their billionaire ruler, Dr. Raymond Cocteau. And it is soon revealed that Dr. Cocteau himself has orchestrated the release of Phoenix to eliminate one of his last political enemies, the leader of an underground resistance that lives in abject poverty and rejects Cocteau's Puritan fascism. A pure plot summary certainly sounds conservative, but the comedy does so much for this movie. The Warzone LA is comparable to the future in Terminator, Stallone's quippy portrayal is framed like an over-the-top pastiche, Snipes is on some golden age supervillain activity, Bullock's character is making fun of masculine performance like she's a quirky zookeeper. They seem to be friends, yet he speaks to him in the most profane manner. Well, if you had read my study, you would know that this is how insecure heterosexual males used to bond. People wipe their ass with seashells. He doesn't know how to use the three seashells. <laughs> There's also the fact that Cocteau's villainy is unmasked when Spartan discovers that the burglar is raiding a restaurant. The restaurant is Taco Bell because every restaurant is now Taco Bell because they emerged victorious from a franchise war, leaving a monopoly on the food industry. Are just stealing food. He even chastises Huxley for being excited by the sight of him beating on desperate, hungry people. And after seeing that Cocteau has resurrected Phoenix to eliminate the rebel leader, it's clear that Cocteau's utopic vision only serves his larger ambitions. And by securing such a massive amount of power under private ownership, he's free to exploit without consequence. The film even presents the cryo prison as cruel and excessive punishment, with Spartan lamenting the separation from his family, and asserting that contrary to what people are told, he was conscious throughout his sentence. In the climax, Spartan, the demolition man, blows up the entire building while the underground revolutionary leads his group to the surface. Of course, Spartan is just the one good cop trope when it's all said and done, but the beauty of this movie lies in its parodic tone. It's structurally pretty standard Hollywood fare, doused with absurd comedy, and that general 90s skepticism toward institutions, resulting in a movie where an explicitly ridiculous vision of a super cop abandons his post as defender of capital to help the poor and destroys a prison. Director Marco Bambia was actually relatively young for the job, 28, and despite a pretty successful debut, he never went on to direct another film. Instead, he retreated into the art world, where he's focused on video installations and found imagery. His artwork often aims to recontextualize existing media, and what few words he spared on his leaving Hollywood paints the image of somebody very disillusioned with the studio system. When asked by online magazine The Talks in 2015 why he turned his back on Hollywood so quickly, he said, Once I realized the importance of marketing and the importance of everything other than the content itself, I didn't last very long. I just had a sense that it wasn't really fulfilling for me creatively, and I went back to making things that were more personal and that I was more passionate about. I didn't feel like it was a filmmaker's medium anymore in 1993. It was becoming much more of a producer's medium. Now I would say it's not even a producer's medium anymore, it's more of a marketing department's medium. Screenwriter Daniel Waters, meanwhile, spoke to Vulture in 2020 about the reverberating relevance of the film. Both due to its accidentally accurate predictions about the future, uh, such as Arnold Schwarzenegger's political career and customs of social distancing following a series of pandemics, as well as its very early riffing on the concept of PC culture. And when asked about how he sees the PC culture aspect of the film today, he said, Somebody linked me to this diehard, I'll put it charitably, libertarian guy who wrote, Actually, Demolition Man is the great thesis statement of the 90s. It was like, whoa, whoa. 
Mm. What am I going to be, Mr. Anti-Politically Correct now? No, just having a little fun. Remember, Stallone says that Dennis Leary is going to have to clean up again, and they're both going to have to mess up. I am in the mood. It sounds like he's more of a liberal himself, but the increasingly uniform family movie tone of blockbusters is starting to reflect that ad-speak sentiment in the film. And that seems like something both Waters and Rumbia would agree on. As an umbrella term is recognizable today as something of a dog whistle for the distaste of diversity on screen and political messaging that's anything left of dudes rock. But it should just about be common sense that corporate pandering isn't welcomed by actual leftists. It's annoying reductive co-opting of social justice rhetoric, and we're painfully aware that it is a marketing tactic. Some cornballs definitely still eat up any and all representation, as if Disney hiring Lin-Manuel Miranda does anything for the wealth disparity in Latinx communities or cancels out the fact that the company tried to copyright Tia de los Muertos. But in the average person's regurgitated opinion on wokeness, there's a kernel of truth that media Media is increasingly sanitized to make it marketable to the broadest possible audience. It just depends on mischaracterizing the relationship, or lack thereof, between the left and corporate media. Nobody likes seeing ads speak to dominate media or the distillation of art into generic algorithm-based products. But if you're under the false impression that Joseph I want to give the cops more money Biden is a socialist, you're more likely to buy into unfettered capitalism as a solution than actual socialist calls for regulating the entertainment industry. However, when you take away big scary words and just describe policy, a lot of times people believe in much more left-wing ideas than they think. And that's basically the entire vibe that Demolition Man gives me. A centrist conflation of liberal and conservative nightmares about the future of this country that intersect with the growth of the hyper-capitalist film industry. And that's why I find it such an accidentally agreeable film, as well as an entertaining cultural time capsule. An entire city shouldn't be privately owned, for Puritan values are suffocated. Prison isn't an effective or ethical response to crime. The mission of opulent futurism is one for the wealthy at the expense of the poor. Wealthy businessmen do not do charity out of the goodness of their hearts. Wealth disparity leads to crime. And supervillain criminals and action hero cops are something that could never realistically be depicted. They're a mythic relic of a past era, a romanticized image of what life was like. And that image is really fucking funny if you look at it from the right angle. You will find display.